If you look at how undervalued silver is, I think that's an important point to, to be made. If you look at the highs that were clocked by most metals, precious metals, platinum group metals, base metals in 1980, we're talking several decades ago and, and when silver and gold both peaked, silver remains the only one of all of those metals that is below its 1980 high. So silver is cheap on that basis. It's cheap on an inflationary adjusted price basis. And if you look at what happened in the 1970s, gold was up 14 times, so 1400%, and silver was up 37 times, so 3700%. And I think that we're in an environment that's similar to the 1970s, not exact. I don't think, you know, history repeats exactly. It certainly rhymes. And some of the differences are that in the 1970s, the debt to GDP ratio in the US, for example, was about 35%. So much, much lower debt levels. Today, it's at 130%. So to think that, you know, central banks can raise rates enough to actually dent inflation, I think is pie in the sky. It, that simply will not happen. Inflation will run. Uh, people will have to get used to it. And it's unfortunate because if you look at what inflation does to your buying power, I think it's at 5.4 percent inflation over about six or seven years, you'll lose 40 percent of your buying power. So $100 is worth $60 in about six or seven years, and that's at 5.4 percent. So people really, really need to wake up to inflation, what it does to your investments. And if they don't want their retirement to be stolen by inflation, they need to look at proven hedges like, uh, like silver that, as I say, have proven themselves over decades and even millennia. You know, silver is certainly used in a lot of applications. It's crucial to industry and it has proven itself as money as an inflation hedge and value protection over years. But silver is a much smaller market than gold. And it being such a small market, it doesn't get the attention that gold gets. It's about a tenth the size of the gold market. If you look on a supply basis every year, gold being about, I think it's 270 billion, silver being worth about 27 billion annually. So silver being such a small market versus gold, it means that silver tends to be a lot more volatile. It actually does outpace gold's returns in bull markets. And so you definitely want exposure to silver. Uh, you may want to do so in a maybe more limited way because of its volatility, but the volatility would should not be, in my view, something that any investor would want to use as a reason to not participate in silver investing. But what happened in 2020 when we had the pandemic and people flocked to gold and silver as chaos hedges and uncertainty hedges, there was a lot of uh, silver buying in both you know, physical, but also ETF buying. And globally, silver ETFs actually took in about 330 million ounces of, of silver, which was about four times the previous year's level at, at about 83 million ounces. So that was really dramatic. It's very interesting how even after the silver price might have run up and then takes a dip, in some cases, it might be a considerable pullback. There is very little selling that takes place in silver ETFs in terms of their silver holdings. So since 2006, when the first silver ETF came to be, the SLV, silver holdings in silver ETFs globally have climbed dramatically and have very rarely backed off. Barely budge even when you get big sell-offs in the silver price. So people who buy silver through silver ETFs tend to actually hold on. So the ounces, the number of ounces have stayed high and have continued to climb ever since the inception of, of the SLV. Silver being again, a much smaller market than gold. If you look at uh, what's taken place previously is that, you know, get gold gets most of the attention. It starts to build up. It's the, the better known hedge, so to speak. Uh, it's the go-to initially at least. And so people often are late to the party. They'll see gold go up and continues to, to climb let's say gold, you know, goes up, I'm not even going to make a prediction right now, but you know, several times, let's say higher even than it is currently, it's certain that it's going to attract a lot of attention. And if people see gold at multiple thousands of dollars per ounce, they're going to feel like they've missed that opportunity. They're going to look for alternatives. Silver naturally becomes that alternative. They'll see it at a much lower price per ounce and feel like, okay, silver has been rising as well, but I can get a lot more ounces per dollar for silver than I can for gold. I'm going to buy some silver. 
and it's a much smaller market and that just sort of feeds on itself and pushes silver up dramatically. If you look at the best single indicator, at least that I know of, for whether gold is either heading towards or likely to be in and stay in a rallying or a positive price environment is real rates. So that's essentially the rate of interest minus the inflation rate. And if you look at gold versus the real rate of return, gold tends to move inversely, very clearly inversely to the real rate. In 2018, real rates peaked and then started falling. That's when inflation started to rise and we've been in a rising price environment for gold ever since. And interestingly, if you create the same chart of real rates versus silver, it's almost identical to the gold versus real rates chart. And so that, again, for me at least, is a very clear indicator as to where silver is heading. And I believe we're going to remain in a negative real rate environment for several more years. And that's a perfect setup for silver. I provide silver peak indicators, uh, that's what I call them. And one of them is the fear of missing out. And so anecdotally, I mean, in 1980, you had people lining up for blocks to buy silver around the time that it peaked. And, you know, uh, that was the month of January. So if you could imagine people lining up for blocks, uh, you know, in in the Northern hemisphere in, in cold environment because they want silver that badly after it having run up so dramatically, well, that would certainly be something you'd want to look at. It's that uh, cocktail party indicator. You've got the gold-silver ratio. As I say, I think uh, anything uh, around, say, 30 to 1 silver to gold would be a time to start looking at a potential high in the silver price. And I also talk about how to exit. It doesn't have to be, you know, an all or nothing kind of thing. You can certainly look at layering out the way you could layer in when you buy a silver investment and start selling perhaps part of your silver portfolio in tranches and do that, you know, at 25% at a time. If you're not sort of completely convinced that we've reached a peak, uh, you can do that. Perhaps you'll layer across that peak and you could still do exceptionally 